Okay, let's get going. We're at the West Barn tonight. This is my barn and studio. Thank you all for having me, the engineering room. Uh, really pumped to be here. This is fun for me. I really enjoy hanging out with people that are passionate about mixing records and making music. Anything, uh, anybody that has a fire for that, I like them already. So thank you for coming. And like I said, this link will be up for you to share later. It's just uh, you're watching it live, but it will turn into a permanent video once we close it out tonight. So we're here in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, I'm Joe West. I'm a mix engineer and songwriter and record producer who's lived in a couple of cities, but has end up here, ended up here in Nashville for the last 14 years. And we love it down here. Um, we were able to build this barn on our property where uh, it's a private studio where I do all my work. I'll take you for a little tour around it. We're actually using a really cool streaming box called Sling Studio. Can you see it, bud? Uh, yeah. Go ahead and switch over to me. Yeah. All right, so this is my studio, the West Barn. It is a big timber frame barn, and it's where I make all my records. Got some ISO booths back there that you can already see in the first shot. Um, a lot of old barn wood. All the barn wood that you see on this was from the old barn that was on this structure. It was a tobacco barn. All those kitchen cabinets are made out of it. And then we've got, oh, what do we got here? You look guilty. Go get him. <laughs> That's Maxine. Uh, a couple of ice We've got a drum booth in here with a sonar drum kit, a vintage drum kit. We've got a bunch of guitars hanging on the walls. We just sort of pick them off and, and play them as we need them. A lot of microphones are living in this ice booth right now, but we're able to track a lot of people in this barn at one time. I've tracked 10, 12 people at the same time. And we'll even use the bathroom back there in the corner. You can see the little doors open behind the kitchen. Uh, we got that wired up and with tie lines and whatnot. So this is it. This is where I make my records. And I'm lucky enough to spend my time uh, doing what I want to do. It's a private studio for the most part, but there are other records that happen here. Can you um, go back to the main camera, bud? Um, so a lot of other records do happen here, but they kind of just happen, you know, as one degree of separation. So we also run the school out of here, the Apprentice Academy, which is, it's, um, it's a philosophy based off of really immersing yourself in the, in the art, in the job, you know, so you want to be an engineer, so it's really about a hardcore curriculum, and then, no thank you, give me that. It's a curriculum, but we're really spending most of our time hands-on. Uh, we're always mixing, we're always recording, we're always producing, all three at one time. And we've got a great group of guys going through right now this semester, and Trey is one of those guys, and he's got spectacular mixes, kind of blowing my hair back with his mixes. We do distance programs, so Trey's part of the distance program out of, um, out of Texas, and we've got uh, other students, we've got uh, Jeff up in Chicago, um, so we do, do do a distance program, and we've got some guys here in person doing it as well. We keep the classes small because we want to make sure that it's really focused on really like, a, like an apprenticeship. So you would study under a person, and then in that job, you would take over that job and continue on. So we're hoping, this is a 16-week program, we're hoping that people in the 17th week will be starting their career uh, rather than being at the end of a program. The 17th week for us is the first week. You know, that really is the test of whether or not we're going to be able to be successful engineers. So we go into deep depth with the curriculum, but then we go really into big, a real big push on our mission statements as to what it is we want to accomplish and try to figure out how to build, keep, generate, and continue working. Awesome. So what we're going to do tonight is I'm going to take you through this mix. I talked to Trey and said, hey, what would be the best use of our time? And, and I think that he said, um, thank you for the t-shirt, by the way, Trey. And I'm a new member of the engineering room. I was inducted le this last week, so I'm one of you. Um, Trey thought our time would best be spent by us just talking about mis mixing f my mixing philosophy and sort of how, to, how I get a mix up. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Then we'll have some questions and answers. This, my way may not be your way, uh, but it is certainly the one that I've found that's worked for me. I've been doing this 30 years now and I've been struggling. I had struggled through that period of being able to keep my perspective and be able to sign off on things, be able to finish things. So I came up with a, a way of mixing that I think really does that for me, keeps me fresh and keeps me inspired while I'm mixing. Because you have to have vision as a mix engineer. Um, you don't get those first listens back. You know, a first listen is something that's very valuable to listen to something for the first time and be able to hear it fresh. And um, I try to do that 
I try to maintain that freshness throughout. Tonight, we are going to be using a song um, by a group called Farewell Angelina. It's a, uh, a girl group that signed to a record label, and I um, had been writing with them and producing some sides on them. Uh, they cut one of my songs for the record that's coming out in January. This is a song that didn't make the record, but it's one that I wrote with them, and we worked up into like a glorified demo. So what you're going to be hearing here is a demo, but it, that word is a, an odd, it's sort of a misnomer. It's not really a demo. I really work hard on trying to make these sound great. And while I don't get to spend a long time like I would spend on a record, the time I do spend on these songs, I try to make sure I communicate the point and get it, uh, get it to a point where it really feels like, uh, like I had intended and like me and the girls had intended as the songwriters for this song. This was a cool song. I wish I had the work tape to play you because if I played you the work tape of us playing this out on my porch with just an acoustic guitar and them singing it, you would be blown away at how similar the final record is to everything that that demo felt like, that little iPhone demo. So um, it was really, for all the records I've done, this one might be the, the, most, the most true to the work tape. There was a lot of great things that carried on into a bigger production like this. So, um, hey buddy, Zach, whenever I go and I'm working on the screen, and you see me looking at the screen, you can just switch over to the screen and then back to me when I'm talking, you know, just click back and forth as, as appropriate. All right, guys, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to play a, I'm going to take you from an all the way faders down mix, not even, you can see there's no outputs assigned, no inputs, no outputs. And this isn't a big session, but it's not a small session, you know, it's a um, medium sized session and there's a lot of vocals. So it's, it, maybe the illusion is it's a little bigger than what it is. Down here you can hear this is my mix. I'm going to go ahead and play my mix for y'all. I'm going to be wearing headphones tonight. Keep in mind we're streaming out to the internet so the stream isn't going to be full quality. But the stream is really good. It's good enough to hear, you know, it's not a final master. It's a variable bit rate, you know, because it's an MP4 codec. So that bit rate's going to vary throughout. So the quality is going to go up and down in the stereo image. So it's not going to be this perfect thing. But we're going to try to get the point across. And, um, and I might be wearing, you might see me wearing headphones. A lot of people um, give me grief for wearing headphones. But I only wear them during the videos so y'all don't have to hear the speakers. I don't wear them when I work. My normal workflow, I do not wear headphones. I mix in this room. Um, so I wear the headphones as a courtesy so that the speakers are not bleeding all over my microphone and ruining your mix. So I'm going to put these headphones on, and we're going to listen down together to what I ended up with uh, as a final mix for this song. Um, I remember, I really like the band. The girls are so good. I'm excited for the record to come out. One of the other songs that I wrote with them is on the record, so I'm excited for that. So let's listen down from the top. It's called If You Got Them, Smoke Them. You're gonna hear my money drop at the bar down the block. Only top shelf shots, cause that's how we do it. Let's get busy living, show them what they're missing. Here's to burning, here's to aiming, here's to bucket list vacation. Here's to doubling down when you don't know what they're holding.
the ultra professional fade out. So there you have it. That's what that song sounded like. You know, as I remember it, I probably went out into the analog world. I've got, you know, not that you have to, but you know, I've got these great analog boxes and I love what they do to it. Um, could I live without them? Yeah, I could live without them. It's just a matter of being able to tweak that. I keep telling people, it's like, you know, uh, I told the guys in the class two weeks ago, or maybe, I, we had Steve Marcantonio, a fantastic national engineer, uh, in here to hang with us one night. And, and I was telling, I told Steve and the guys that I believe that every piece of gear that you need to make a hit record was made before 1975. So I don't chase gear. I've got some really great gear. I got a nice Studer tape machine, a bunch of great microphones, a bunch of really high-end compressors and whatnot in the racks. But um, I don't chase plugins. I don't chase gear. I really feel like it's a crutch. Uh, I feel like if you gave a guy like Frank Filippetti, well, they did give him. They gave him 202Rs to record James Taylor's Hourglass, and he won Album of the Year. Uh, they gave Chris Lord Algae a record that I heard was going to be thrown away, and he mixed it, and it was American Idiot, and became, you know, a Grammy Award-winning record. I believe that you you use the tools that you have. If you don't have a hammer, you fashion something into a hammer, and you do the work that the hammer can do. So, uh, as a personal thing, I try to just work with the gear I have, and if I find something, somebody shows me a piece of gear that I can't live without, I buy it. Um, but I don't do that too often. I feel like what I've got here is perfect for me. Uh, in my life, I use this SSL compressor quite a bit, and I use this Neve. I got a set of Neve 32 264As out of the old 80s, 58s and 68s. They're right here. I use those quite a bit. I've got a mainly variable MU over there that I use quite a bit, as well as some radio broadcast limiters over here that are kind of um, really almost like effects box. You know, like if I put something through it to compress it, compress it on those, it's the equivalent of sending it out through like an effects pedal almost because it's just such a drastic thing, excuse me, drastic thing that it does. So um, if I took away these analog compressors, I feel like I get the same results in the box. The box is really good right now. Um, but there are some things that I will say, like hitting a transformer, it just does something to the mid-range. But you know, Waves has that great plug-in for the whatever it is. Uh, maybe one of you guys can put it down in the comments. It's their console, the NLS bus and channel. I feel like those do a really good job of emulating lower mid-range. Uh, but that's why I go out to this kind of stuff, and it's in my racks, and I use it. Uh, so that's probably on this mix. But I think I could get to this mix and probably get right at it with um, in-the-box stuff. We're going to stay in the box today, but we're going to keep this mix up just so we can reference it every blue moon. Um, so whenever I'm about to mix a song, whether it's a song that I've produced or I've written, or it's a stranger song that's been sent to me, over an FTP site and I'm just getting to know them through the music, I will immediately get the session up. I try to not listen to anything. I try to get my session ergonomic set up so that I've got my routing ready to go. I don't traditionally template things because my workflow is very simple as you're going to see. But um, I'll try to get through and make sure that by the time I hit my space bar for the first time, I'm listening to music. I feel like it's a race when I hit that space bar to be able to get things up quickly and be influenced and excited about them and maybe get the vibe that they're giving me, get the hearing them fresh for the first time and having ideas. And I don't want to waste those ideas. So I very quickly try to get the drums up, try to get the bass up, try to get the guitars up, the pianos, if there's, you know, drum machine stuff or loops or whatever it is. I try to get the song up very, very quickly. We did an exercise in class and I wasn't necessarily trying to be fast this week, but I got a song up that was a 70 track mix. I got it up in seven minutes to a point where it kind of felt like a record. And I do that not to be fast. Nobody cares how fast you mix a song. But I get it, I try to get it up quickly so I can have some inspiration and try to get a vision. And then I bounce quickly but back and forth between things. I'll never stay down in the drum kit and just work on the drum kit. Because when you put your guitars over the drum kit, they sound totally different. I always tell the guys it's like if you were standing at a bus stop, you would hear somebody speak to you, you could hear every nuance that they're saying, but if a bus goes by, well then you're going to maybe hear what they say, but all the timbre of their voice, you're not going to be able to hear any of the qualities of that. So if you've got your guitars blaring over top of something, they're soaking up all those frequencies that the drums are in. So you're going to be, you're going to not like your drum sound anymore. So I try to get, the, I'm going to show you today how I got my drums up and how I go through this pretty quickly and with the minimal plugins and try to get a sound so that I can then hear what I believe the song wants to be 
right? What does the song want to be? What does it want to say? Does it want to go this direction? Because if I just start EQing drums and making my kick drum the best kick drum sound in the world, well, then I'm going to end up with a kick drum that maybe is, in the, is not in the direction that I should be going. Or if I put a bunch of delays on the guitars, I may find out that all those delays are stepping on vocal phrasings later on in the, um, when I bring the vocal up. So the idea for me has been, what I've slowly come to is that I want to get those faders up, I want to listen. If the guy wrote it on piano, maybe I'll bring the piano and the vocal up and listen. If he wrote it on acoustic guitar, you can kind of tell how a song was written or generated. You put up an acoustic guitar and a vocal or whatever that center of the song is. Try to listen to that and get an idea for where the inspiration from the songwriter or the center of that song is. And then take it the way that song wants to go. I used to mix these songs and I'd just go my direction. This is my drum sound. This is my bass sound. These are my guitar sounds. And I didn't care about their music. And then it was contradictory to the outcome of what that song wanted to be. And I slowly found out that if I paid attention to what they were doing and where the song wanted to head, well, then I could then lean into it. It would, it would be much easier. It wouldn't fight me. I wouldn't be battling with the song. So real quick before we start, I want to have a little lesson on phase. Uh, phase is one of those voodoo topics that people don't seem to understand. Um, I'm going to talk about two kinds of phase. Absolute phase and relative phase. Uh, and phase, for those of you who don't know, it's, uh, for instance, relative phase would be the relationship between 10 microphones and a drum kit. So when you hit that snare drum, you get 10 mics on the drum kit that's all listening to that snare drum, and they're all different distances from that snare drum. So they're going to have an effect on one another. And you will have some out of phaseness in a drum kit. It's inherent because the mics are spaced around that room. It's a good thing to have phase in your drum kit because it adds to the dimension, the illusion of dimension. You don't want it to be so far out of phase that it's causing issues. So we're not going to really talk about relative phase. We're going to talk about absolute phase as a mix engineer. Absolute phase, uh, uh, the, let me simplify it. It would be the equivalent of the way your speakers push and pull. So let's say when we zoom in here to this kick drum. You're changing with me, bud, whenever I go back and forth like this? Sure. Thank you, bud. We're going to look at a kick drum. I'm going to zoom in here, and I'm going to assign it an output just so it doesn't look so gray. OK, great. We're going to zoom in here. You can see this kick drum, as it starts right here, it's going up to the north, to the top of the screen. That's positive phase. You can see the sub kick that I have right below it. It's one of those little, it's a Solomon uh, low freak. It's a really great sounding sub kick. Uh, you can see here, let me give him an output so we could see. You can see he's going south. This is negative phase. Positive phase, negative phase. Now, what's important to know here is that this is, when you talk about polarity and phase, I don't know the difference between the two of those words. I know there is a difference. I use them interchangeably, and I'm sure that there's a nuanced difference between them. But for instance, this, we're going to say in positive phase, when this kick drum hits, the guy hits it, it's going to tell your speakers to recreate that sound, and your speakers and tweeters will both vibrate. You got it back on me, bud, so they can see my hands? Uh, yeah, please stay on top of that. So it's going to vibrate. Your speakers are going to vibrate. And they're going to shake the air and create those frequencies and replicate them so that when you hear it back, you hear it. Now, does that speaker start pushing out or pulling in? That's what we're talking about here. So in this instance, this kick drum will hit. One of the signals is telling the speaker to move forward. One of the signals is telling the speaker to move backwards. So what do you have here? You have a tug of war in your speaker. So the one thing I tell guys is to check your absolute phase on important things in your mix. If you want to start off already, you know, mixing is a game of inches. If you want to start off and be successful, go ahead and get a competitive advantage, a 10, 20% competitive advantage because your mix will be more powerful. Imagine if you were the poor speaker trying to drag this song up a hill and you got, every time the kick drum hits, half of the signal's telling you you go back down the hill and half's telling you you go back up. So you want to make sure that the phase is correct. Right? And you need to listen to this stuff. There's times where I've left snare drums out of phase because they just sounded better to me. I hate that they sound better to me sometimes out of phase, but I'll leave them out of phase. You know, I'm, first and foremost, I like to think of myself as an artist, and I'm going to make decisions based off of creativity in my ear. And, and I won't ever follow the meters just to follow the meters. In this instance, I know this sub kick's not going to work. 
it's going to be pushing the speaker the wrong way. I've done it a million times, and I know that. So you can go up, on, up under Audio Suite here, under Other, and you can go to Invert. Uh, I hit the wrong one. Audio Suite, Other, Invert, and then you could just reprint this. You could re-render this track and watch. Boom. There it goes. So now it's positive phase. They're both telling the speaker to go out. I'm going to undo that. They're both telling the speaker to pop out, to push out rather than push in first. And I don't know, maybe it tells it to, I don't know which way positive. I would assume positive phase would tell that speaker to push out first, but uh, whatever that may be, they're both in sync. I'll check the low end instruments in my mix. Uh, I'll make sure that the low end, and when, you've, when you're messing with phase and putting on it, or you could solve the same, the same issue you could solve with a plugin by just putting a one band EQ on it. Let's just go to a native plugin, right? Right, let's go to a simple DSP plugin, one band, and just pop in the phase button. That would do the same thing. That's going to reverse your phase right there. So you can do it either way. You can print it as an inverted file through Audio Suite, or you can go put a plugin on it and reverse the phase. And I'll listen through that. And if you pop that, whenever you're on that plugin, you're popping it, you're listening, you're popping in and out of the phase, in phase, out of phase, in phase, or reverse phase, in positive phase or reverse phase. When you're doing that, you'll hear the low end become more apparent. And you, you always try to choose the more low end version, something that has a little bit more beef to it, because that's where you're going to really hear phase, especially in this kick drum situation. And I'll try to make sure that my, in my mix that I've got a kick drum and I've got a, my bass guitar. I've got these things are, are all really trying to tell my speakers to go the correct way. When it comes to overheads and toms, I'll listen and audition. And if it doesn't bother me, if, I'm, if I don't care one way or the other, I will just make the phase look correct. But if I do care one way or the other, I'll leave them in that state. If it sounds better with the, flab, with the phase uh, reversed, I'll leave it there. Maybe it's not the right thing to do, but I have to answer to my uh, artist sense before my engineering sense. That's just the way I do it. Um, and I'll work my way through the mix. I don't mess around so much with electric guitars just because the frequency spectrum is a lot higher and moving, you know, it's, we're not dealing with these sub frequencies that are really the power of your mix. All right, so um, that's our little lesson on phase. And we can, we, you can ask me more questions about that if you have it in the question and answer period that we're coming up with. But I'm going to show you how I work here. So this would be a mix I just got in from somebody. First of all, I would go ahead if it was, if it had a ton of kick drums, a bunch of snare samples, or it had a, a hundred guitars, I would sort them out and maybe I'd even make stems of them. I'd make subgroups going out through a more manageable thing. You know, sometimes I'll get mixes with over a hundred tracks and, and it's just too much for the mind to deal with. So I'll try to go in there and make my session uh, make sense to me. So like I'd, if I didn't want to see all these drums, I could make just a drum subgroup and make, hide all these drum tracks here. And then what we'd be hearing is just the drum track. We'd have a stereo fader with drums on it. And we could make our, we could make our session a lot smaller. I mean, let's take a look at this session here. I'm going to make everybody fit the window. So this is what we're looking at here. Like I said, not crazy big, but not small. Maybe there's 20, 30 tracks here, maybe more than that. Probably more like 30, 40 tracks. Um, so what I would do is I would go through and make sense. For me, I, in my old console days, I would have my kick drum down on the end. So you see, I got my kick drum here, my kick sub here, snare drum, shoulder mic, hi-hat, tom one, tom two, overheads, barn. This is the room mics for the barn. Then a mono barn. And then we get into tambourine. That'd be percussion. Uh, that's the end of my drum kit. My drum kit is always in this sequence. If they have three toms, there's three toms there. Uh, I always have it in this order. Why would I ever change it? I don't want to allocate any more brain thought process to where I put the overheads. I want to keep myself moving quickly, and I just want to reach for things whenever I know I want them. I want them where I have always had them, so that all of my mental, all my mental activity is really, is really focused on the creativity of the song. And a lot of times, I'll just put symbol on the, when I had consoles, I would just write a tambourine, I'd make a tambourine. For a click, I'd put a quarter note. For the vocal, I'd put a star or an, or an asterisk. Just so I could see it, so I didn't have to do that thought process of reading the word and knowing it's the vocal, just so I could be at zero degrees separated from the music. So, and then you see I get into my bass guitar here, then keyboards, then electric guitars, then acoustic guitars, 
and utility instruments, other stringed instruments. Of course, you see here, this is uh, an asterisk, so that's a vocal. And then I've got a lot of vocals here. And these are just vocals that I never committed to subgroups. I just never did, because um, I may have in my mix session. This is the unmixed session. Um, I, I think I was just moving so fast on this song, and we were moving through so many songs that I think I just brought it up and mixed it and kept them on individual faders. So there's a lot of background vocals happening in this song, doubles and triples of vocals and counterparts, as you could have, because you heard. There's a whole center section where we kind of go into like a, a, a weird fantasy world. But you can see down here, these, these are vocals here. You see, these, all these tracks are just for the center section in the outro. So, you know, this is really where our vocals live, right in here. There's only really four, three or four, not a ton of vocals going through the whole song. They're just taking up a lot of tracks. All right, so I'll try to figure out what the song, you know, how it's laid out, and I'll take all my drums. So we'll do this real quick. This is, I'm going to give you a secret of mine, and, um, and I'll give you a, a, little, a little couple plugins that will change the way you mix, hopefully. So I'm going to take all my drums. I'm going to go to the end of my drums, and in Pro Tools, whatever you have selected on the screen, when you add a new, new track, it puts it to the end, right to the right of the highlighted track. So I just put a stereo aux there. I'm going to call that drums. All right, I'm going to put another stereo aux, and we're going to call this one master. And I use auxes for my masters rather than master VCAs because I run audio actually through them. It has more routing options as well. Uh, so it's very helpful. I'm going to mute this so we don't hear that in our mix. Let me go up. I'm going to leave the vocals. Since there's so many vocals, I'm going to leave the vocals to the right. I'm going to end at the lead vocal. Put my master there for now. Just give my session size. Uh, try to eliminate. I'm going to get rid of all these for the moment. Just make sure I'm looking at what I'm looking at. So this is essentially the whole band. That's nothing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10, 11, 12, 13. Well, wait a minute. There's a stereo. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. 25 tracks. I mean, that's really not much at all. We're going to try to get a big sound out of these 25 tracks. You know, you don't have to have 100 tracks to make it sound big. But all right, I'm going to show you. I've got my, um, my, all my drums. I'm going to route out through this drum bus. I'm not a fan of parallel compression. I'm going to send them all out, bus one and two, we'll say. There they all go. And I'm going to make the input of my drums, bus one and two. I'm going to solo safe my, my drum subgroup so I can solo individual drums and not have to solo my subgroup. Um, I'm going to go to the master now. I'm going to take the drums and everybody else at this point, and I'm going to put them right out to the master. And we'll send the master out 23 and 24. I used to work on a 24 bus console, so that's kind of what I did back in the old days. But you can use any bus. Bus 23 and 24. And I'm going to send this out just to, this is just where my monitor path is. It's going to come out and go to my speakers through an interface. So digital one and two out. We're going to send these out for right now. All right, so now I've got this. I need to solo safe my master. First thing I want you to do, I'm just looking down at my phone. I am not. don't think I'm... Uh, Big time and you guys looking at my phone while we're talking. I'm looking to see if anybody's commenting that we have a problem with the, uh, the live stream. All right, so wave C4 right here. I have a patch. It's called JW. Start here. And I'll make this patch available to you guys so that if you have the C4, if you want to buy the C4, sometimes they go up for 29 bucks. It's based off the too much limiting patch, but I've changed it a little bit. I'm going to take one. I'm going to put it right on the drum kit. And then if you option drag it, in Pro Tools, you could drag it over to your master fader, so it lives in two spots. This is how I'm going to get my mix up. I'm going to go now, and it's what, 739. I'm going to try to get this song up. I'm going to show you the, the real-time tempo of how I would be looking at this song and, um, and what it is, I'd, the way I'd be interacting between these instrument groups like the drums and the bass. And you'll find um, what you'll see me doing, I do on every mix. The music is different. My process is very similar in all my mixes. I tweak it as I need to. I adjust it to the musical content whenever it demands that I do that. But if I just start off with my templates, I'll end up at something that sounds like a record very quick. So we're at 740 here. I'm going to start with the kick drum. And I'm going to come back and tell you a couple things as I do them. But for right now, I'm just going to listen. I'm going to listen on the monitors. So I'm going to turn off my little pack here.
All right. So what are we here? 7.46. Six minutes in. Uh, we're going to listen down here. Uh, I would argue to say, hey, this is a good piece of music now to have an opinion about. Quickly listening, I'm not doing much EQing, only the sort of cliche EQing that's not to fix problems, but to sort of know that, hey, I want this, this gag where I put a little bit up at 10K or maybe even higher on the snare drum, and maybe I'm looking for some meat. Not because the snare drum needs it, because I kind of do that all the time. I find myself dialing those same things in. I'm looking at this compressor. I made a decision to go with a fast attack, fast release, and I use the blue stripe because it's a little grittier. Uh, and that just sort of cleans it up, makes it feel a little bit hairier, a little bit more epic. The C4, which adds a lot of muscle to something. You know, I always put the guitar amp on my bass and the compressor on my bass. I always go with longer release times. I may adjust these, but for right now, they're good. I want to hear what this song wants to be. I throw a vocal compressor on very quickly, longer releases. Uh, I find that longer releases are less ear fatiguing, and I want to make sure I have a ton of energy coming at you, so I want it to be non-fatiguing energy. And I'm just making sure that this ARP, the arpeggiated thing, is working. Uh, I think I remember this to one of these toms having a, a distorted tom, actually, as we recorded it, so we had to trigger a tom to fix it, because this tracking session was moving so quickly. So this, is this tom here, the tom 2, might need to be replaced. I don't even have the hi-hat in at this moment. I'm just trying to get an idea of what this song feels like. Once I get it up, I'll go in and I'll start to do a little bit more surgery. But in six minutes, um, I would defy anyone to feel, if you feel like you're having trouble getting a mix up, with this simple philosophy, you can get your mix up in five, six, 10, 15 minutes, and you can have something to have a really good opinion about. And then you're not just going off and getting stuck in a ditch because you decided you were gonna go work on distorting the bass for 45 minutes when it wasn't a good idea for the song. You've listened to the song a couple times in an upstate where you feel like, okay, I kind of know what this song wants to be. Me and the song have a relationship. We know what it would do and wouldn't do. So um, let's take a listen down just to this uh, six minute mix and see that it actually feels a little bit like a record. Let me put a, I'm just gonna get some level up for the monitor here. L2. I'm not gonna use this to compress, I'm just gonna use this to bring level up. This is just a, glorified volume knob right now. All right, listening. A little non-stop tick-tock waiting on five o'clock. You're gonna hear my money drop at the bar down the block. Only top shelf shots, cause that's how we do. Let's get busy living, show them what they're missing. Here's the burn, here's the aim, here's the bucket list vacation. Here's the doubling down when you don't know what they're holding. Here's the muscle cars, here's the pie tattoos, here's a drop in a grain on some Jimmy Choo. Everybody's got the way to go. So when you got them, smoke them, 
Okay. So we don't have to listen to the whole thing. But I think that's, a pretty, if I do say so myself, I think that's a great piece of music to have an opinion about. And I think as producers and mix engineers, it's not, you're a producer as a mix engineer, we are in the business of having opinions, right? And uh, even in my personal life, I'm guilty of having an opinion about anything, if you know me. Um, so that's what we want to do. Give ourselves, we have to have movement as creators. You have to be moving through something to have an opinion about it. The minute you stop, you're dead. There's no ideas. So we want to have, in six minutes, we gave ourselves an opportunity to have an opinion about a lot of things. I listened through that. I liked a lot of what I heard. I thought, oh, I want to do this here. I want to do that there. I want to make that guitar a little bit different. I want to do this. But I didn't have any of those ideas six minutes earlier. And a lot of people would still be on their kick drum at this point. So and me included, when I started out, that's where I would be at that point. I'd be making sure the beater of my kick felt good, getting the world's most perfect kick drum sound that isn't going to matter once I put the rest of the stuff in. Uh, let's remember, we need to listen as a whole. Get that music up, have an opinion about it as a whole. Say it needs more low end, it needs to push a little more. It needs to have a little more smack in the snare. It needs to have more, oh, what that guitar player is doing there is really cool. Let's make sure we EQ that a little bit differently so it speaks. Those are all ideas and inspiration and vision that we didn't have 10 minutes earlier or six minutes earlier. I think that's pretty incredible. So I just want to show you real quick, this is the secret sauce here. We'll take, um, I'm going to, um, let me move these plugins down here because I'm going to mute the top line. I'm going to move all these plugins down so they're out of the way. You're changing screens, screens with me, right bud? I am, sir. Huh? I am. Thank you. All right, how do I do this? Do I do this? Yes, I do. All right, so I'm just going to turn off and on the C4s. I want to play this mix for you with and without the C4s. So as I'm playing it, you'll see on screen when they're dark blue, that means they're off. When they're gray, that means they're engaged. So I just want you to hear the difference between this mix with and without the C4s. The gain staging, the gain staging matters for this. So hopefully I'll, the gain staging isn't. Uh, I won't have to stop and fix the gain staging to make it equal. Out. sounds like somebody has a blanket over a wet towel or just a blanket over the mix and when you put these C4s in it brings everything to life. They're multi-band limiters. I haven't set up as limiters right now. Kind of, uh, kind of modeled after radio, what a radio broadcast limiter would do. So let's just, let's just listen again real quick. I'll try to do it on the measures. I'm doing a horrible job, I'm sorry, of going in and out with these, but I'll try to be better. Maybe two measures so we have some space. instantly gives that band, it's like they rehearsed it for an extra week. You know, gives them a little muscle, made them a little more sure what they were playing. Now this is, a, this is something that I would encourage you all to steal from me. This is the Joe West, uh, I was doing a plug-in with Waves a couple years ago, a, a signature plug-in that never saw the market, but it was sort of based off of this philosophy. So uh, feel free, if you get that C4, I will give you this Joe West patch here, and you pull these up and put them on your master fader, put them on your drum bus, and you'll be a rock star in six minutes. Uh, I think it adds a ton to just the energy of the kid. I don't know how that's translating over the live stream, but um, it is a big difference from going from zero to hero. Like, hey, this feels like a recording of me whenever I'm recording my band as a senior in high school to this feels like a record. It has a lot of that record aspect to it. Um, 
All right, so real quickly, I want you to just see a couple things about my signal flow in my session here. And let's look at this session, right? This is a session that kind of feels pretty good at this state for where we're at six, six minutes into a song, right? But let's look here. What do we have on it? We've got a phase reverse, so nothing other than a phase reverse there. We've got an SSL snare, on our, SSL on our snare, and I'm cranking in some high end and a little bit of low end. Um, and then you got nothing on the whole drum kit until you get to the C4. So this is not a parallel situation. All these tracks get routed out through two buses and show up here. This is the only instance of these drums. If I mute it, the drums go away. No parallel. I'm not a fan of parallel. I haven't found a way to work that into my creative life. So I've got a C4 on it with the, the magic sort of, hey, start here setting. Uh, and then I've got an 1176 with a little bit of compression on it, but quick, real fast attack, real fast release. Um, and then I have, I do this on all the bases, I put it through an 1176, or I'll hit a piece of upward gear with it, and I put it through an amp, and I try to find an amp setting. I'll just go through here, load, go down to the base settings, and I'll listen to the top one in each, the first one in each, and I'll say, okay, this amp is the best, and then I'll tweak it from there. Um, I have nothing on the roads. I did pan it out of stereo and put it off to the right, so it sat right, somewhere specifically. Uh, the ARP I left in stereo because it's an arpeggiator and it's got some processing that's uh, sort of pinging around, both of them. Guitars wide left and right, the parts play really well off each other, it's kind of like a Fleetwood Mackie vibe. Uh, acoustic guitars off to the left and then a high strung guitar which is called a, a Nashville 6, I'll solo this for you. It's just the high strings from a 6, from a 12 string pack. It's fine, there it is. And you notice when I solo this stuff, it doesn't sound that different than whenever it's in the mix. This mix speaks very well, very quickly with these C4s on it in these two spots. So if you go ahead and steal the Joe West technique, which is on your drum bus, on your master bus. So the drum bus feeds out bus 23 and 24. So everything else, the drums and everything else, all the way up to the vocal, all go out through bus 23, 24. And then that's the input for our master aux here, where we're doing a little bit of voodoo up here with a C4. And we're doing, we're, this is like I said, just a, a, in essence a volume knob. I'm not, really gonna, I'm not really doing any limiting per se on this right now. I'm just using it to bring level up. All right, so this is a very clean session to be sounding like a record. Now what would I do with this from here? I'd start to be inspired. I was instantly inspired by this guitar right here and I thought, man, Let me get an EQ on that. I might EQ it, who knows. Let's take a look at it. I'm gonna pull up the SSL uh, channel here and see what it wants to be. So something like that maybe where the mid-range would start to speak and maybe, quiet Max, maybe I would start to put some high passes and low passes depending on how much was ringing. But you know, make it a little bit of a rattier guitar. I'm at about 1.5K. I made the bandpass filter a little bit bigger, you see, and I put about 6 dB in there. So you know, those are the kinds of ideas I would start to have at this point. Maybe I do the same kind of thing with the Rhodes because the Rhodes really needs to speak. You know, let's hear that Rhodes real quick. See, there's something really cool down there about 900 hertz. I'm 
I'm just looking for where these instruments have harmonic content in the performance parts where it's like, hey, this is where this, this thing wants to speak. This might want to speak around there. And I try to find another place to voice the guitar. So my guitar that I was just working on was about 1.5K and I'm down under 1K here, like at 900 Hertz uh, with sort of focus making this guy speak a little bit down there. And then I might put the acoustic guitars. I might put some compressors on those. But at this point, I think what I wanted to accomplish today by walking you through this was to get a concept for how levels come up, how to get things to work within each other, how to give yourself the ability to have information coming at you so you can have opinions about the information and they can give you a little bit of vision. I did want to show you one more thing before we went to questions and answers here. All right, so how do you know how to get your levels in a session? Well, you know, in a situation like my studio, I've got this volume knob here that controls the volume for my speakers. But I've also got levels in Pro Tools, right? I've got this master fader that I have at zero, right? And I've got all these other faders at different, different heights. I don't know how many times as a young engineer I found myself in this situation. I'm just going to save this. Where all my faders, I had gotten all the way to the top and I didn't have any room. Fader creep, they call it. And I was like, I had run out of room and I had boosted everything. And then I realized what I had to do was turn everything down and, and refigure the mix, right? Well, you need to be able to tell where you're at in a mix. And the way I do that, let's say, um, for a point of reference, I'm going to use the kick drum in this song, right? I'm going to go bring all the faders down. I'm going to bring the drum subgroup up. I'm going to bring the master up. I'm going to keep those guys at zero. First thing I'm gonna, gonna do is I'm gonna take my kick drum, I'm gonna option click it and put it to zero. Why? Because I know I, pr I recorded this, I know it's printed at the right level. At zero, I know I now have a solid base where zero is. So when I hit this, then I'll start to build around that. First thing I do is bring that snare drum up. I want the kick and snare to pop. Third thing I bring up is the overheads. And I bring them up just high enough that I hear the kits kind of go from a mono kit into a stereo kit. I do listen to the overheads and make sure that they're not too brash, but I'm really looking for a sense of space from these overheads. Right about there. And the cymbals sound pretty good there. And then I'll bring the sub kick up, I'll bring the barns in, the shoulder mic, which goes over his shoulder and points at the snare. That just makes it feel like you're sitting behind the kit. It gives it a more realistic perspective. Watch what happens. So that snare just sounds like, hey, that microphone's only that far from the head of that snare drum but the shoulder mic's farther back, it's where your ears would naturally be. So when I bring this up, it doesn't really do anything other than add a general sense of space and dimension to the drum kit. Add in that sub kick. These barns are great. We record, um, let me take my headphones off. Let's switch over to this camera real quick, buddy. Yeah. And please, switch back and forth to me. Don't just keep it on the screen. It's boring for those guys. I see you over there on your phone. OK, so we put our drum kit in this room here. We don't have the cool blue light on it during a session. This is Sonar Vintage Kit. It sounds really fantastic. It's a nice tight room, and I like it because it's a tight room. People think I'm crazy for not putting it out in this giant barn, which is like everybody's dream, right? If I had a big barn, I'd put it out here. You can see we have an old Ludwig kit sitting over here that I pulled off the top of the shelf we're getting ready to sell. Um, but this particular drum kit here, we like the early reflections that the, that the walls bring. So it kind of feels like a Steely Dan New York room. So we put that in there, we mic it up, it's nice and bright, it jumps off tape. And then we leave this door open right here. And we let all that sound flow out of here into this room where we put some barn mics around. And we get these beautiful room sounds that you can't even get. The biggest problem with a room sound on a drum kit in a big barn if the drums are in the room with it, the cymbals are super harsh. So when you put compressors on it, as everybody does, it ends up being super harsh. So this, we have a nice warm drum sound. I'm going to show you the rooms here. OK, you can switch off of this. So check out these rooms. Nice and dark and beautiful. Let me get my headphones back on.
you can hear the guitars. I guess I had a guitar in, a, in the bathroom or something, but you can hear the band playing as they all went down at the same time. So we get the best of both worlds. You get a tight New York room. And we get a Led Zeppelin. You just feather it in where you want it. And then I do, that's a stereo binaural pair. It means it's about the, the distance of the human head. You have this camera on, bud? Okay, thanks. Sorry I keep t asking. All right, so it's about the distance, two Omni mics about the distance of the head. It's a really great psychoacoustic phenomenon as if your head were in that room. So that's what the barn stereo mics, mics are. They're two TC40Ks. The barn mono mic is a, I had a talk back once that was on and it sounded so great I started recording an SM57. So I've got this mono 57, which kind of feels like a AMS nonlinear room. In the old days, there was a Neve rack mount reverb unit that we used. We'll see how this one sounds, but. It's real mid-rangey and cardboardy, so it really fills out the mid-rangey light. I'll slide it in and you'll hear it. So it gives you a lot of options. You can take this record totally pop and totally tight, or you can make it a really big giant thing. I love the flexibility. I love that my original drum sounds are bright and jumping off tape and have energy and aren't dead from a big room that does, has a lot of volume and won't allow those, so, those sounds to be very in your face. Um, so that's the way we do that. It's, it works out great every time. I know you're not gonna have a giant barn, but um, even with these off, the record still sounds pretty good. It sounds great. So, um, what else did I want to tell you? So we just get these levels up where you kick drums at zero. So now I know I keep my drum fader at zero. I keep my master fader at zero. And I don't move those. I try not to move them unless I have to tweak something at the very end. And you just get the whole mix up real quickly and you know that you have a good relative level, that you have good level throughout your matrix and at your master fader you have good level. I, took, I turned them all down here, but let me just uh, do a real quick revert to saved. And we're going to see here. Okay. Let's look at the levels. We haven't paid any attention to levels. I cranked the snare only because I turned it down in the plugin right here because I was doing so much EQ. So this is kind of a non-representative level. But all these other levels... Look at the levels of my master fader, right where you want them. Just sets you up for success so you're not getting any fader crawl up or down. All right, I think that's pretty much it in regards to the, what I wanted to communicate. Hopefully that was something that you guys saw value in. Um, and if you want to get a hold of me or Trey, I'll, I'll make sure Trey has the uh, Joe West start here drum patch in Master Fader patch. Um, so why don't we sw switch over now to uh, questions and answers. Okay. Okay. Yeah, my phone number, guys, is 615-517-7025. I'll try to get a sheet of paper and write that down. It's in the comments. Okay. So 615-517-7025. Go ahead and text me any of your questions, and uh, I'll do my best to answer them. Hopefully I was clear enough and I didn't confuse you guys with a bunch of craziness. This is a, a really great method of getting your music up and happening quick and having some opinion quickly and be able to have vision and not get yourself off into a ditch. We have a little bit of a delay between my broadcast, about 30 seconds between what I shoot and what you hear. So I'm gonna sit here and wait for some questions. I see Earl says, great Joe. Okay, I'll take that. Thank you, buddy. Earl doesn't have any questions because he's a rock star. He's texting me right now again. Earl was over at my house today. We were, well, I was smoking a cigar. He was secondhand smoking my cigar. All right, so Chris, Chris Cap asks, on a mix like this, C4, 
and 12, I don't know what the 12 is, are your basic FX chains on two mix? Wow, I'm really confused. On a mix like this, C4 and 12, oh, L2, that's an L. Uh, C4 and L2 are on your, are your basic FX chain on the two mix. Yes, usually, the, like I said, the L2 is purely based, um, the L2 is purely just to bring level up. It's the volume knob. I'm not, I'm not trying to get any gain reduction on that. C4 is always on my master fader, always. And it will go off into the analog world. As I continued on with a mix like this, I might add a tape machine simulator or put it to a real tape machine, or I might put it out to the SSL or Neve or to the pull tech. I have a real pull tech EQ, or maybe a pull tech EQ would start living up there. Uh, as I start to shape and really know the, the shape of the song, where it's going, then I would end up in a situation where I'd be making more decisions. But that master fader will always have a C4 on it, and then probably in my life go out to an analog world. If it didn't, it would probably hit a tape simulator there, like the Kramer tape or the Slate, uh, the Slate tape one that I have. I don't know what it's called. Um, and then it might have a pull tech on it or something to just gently change it. Um, hopefully that answers your question, Chris. Show your vocal mixes, please. I'm not sure what that means. Hey, Joe, Earl's friend. Show your vocal mixes, please. Best, Paul. Um, I don't really have a vocal mix up on this right now. I was sort of getting the band up, and then I would probably, at that point, I would probably figure out what this lead vocal is going to get. I'd set it in there. I'd do whatever vocal rides needed to happen, and I'd start to then make sure that I had the support from the background vocals under it getting them placed, making sure they're not stepping on the lead vocal, making sure there's enough space uh, for that to be front and center and those backups to feel like maybe they're, if they're supportive or as a group vocal, gang vocal, maybe they're wide left right, or if it's just a, a third and fifth above the melody, just tight harmonies like what you would hear on, a, on like a Dixie Chicks record or a Rascal Flatts record or you know, a really tight Wilson Phillips record. Like I might put those individually here and here and keep it real intimate. It really would depend. Okay, hold on. The acoustic treatment in my barn, Bill wants to know. Um, so the acoustic treatment in my barn is interesting because uh, I, I was in New York City making a record and then I came to Nashville with Daniel Lanois and Malcolm Byrne and made an Emmylou Harris record. In 2002, that record was nominated for a Grammy. It was um, a really fantastic experience, and, um, and Malcolm Byrne and Daniel Lanwall both use an open control room like this. So I kind of got, uh, I kind of saw the light and I moved to that. So my room is so big that while it has reverb, as you can hear on my voice, the acoustic space, it really um, doesn't have any standing waves. Any standing wave in a space this big would be down in single digits or maybe 10, 12 hertz. So I have a perfectly flat mix environment. Um, and once, and I don't like reverb anyhow, so I usually am sparingly using reverb, and I know how to hear re reverb now after mixing in here so long, but my, f my actual acoustic treatment for this room is nothing. It's a big square wood room. I didn't finish the ceiling at all. It's all unfinished pine. Um, I tried to put a lot of wood on the floor itself so that I just had soft surfaces, and I kept the room big enough that the only thing I was really dealing with was reverb. The room is completely flat, no standing waves. I did buy enough of that Owens Corning 703, those sheets, um, you know, those rigid fiberglass, two foot by four foot. I bought enough to do both walls on the end and I ended up taking them back, I actually ended up selling them, not taking them back, because uh, the room just sounded fantastic and I didn't want it any drier than what it was. Um, so there's not much treatment um, other than being in a room that's big enough that it doesn't need treatment. Um, the reverb sounds great in this room. A lot of times I'll put vocals or things that I want reverb on and put them out and use it as a reverb chamber and record it. So it's a really great space that's pretty flexible. It may not be for everybody. This would never probably work in a commercial room, but it works for me. It's my private room. It suits my workflow, and, um, and I love it. Um, so hopefully that answers your question, Bill. Um, okay, from Kyle. How do you approach kick and bass in terms of level 
And do you ever duck the bass using the side chain from a kick? I don't do that. That sounds like voodoo to me. You know, it's like, it's just not natural. The bass, to me, the bass and the kick drum should be working together. So a kick drum should have all the attributes it needs to poke through and the bass should, should be right on top of it in a way that's appealing. So no, I never side chain and do stuff like that. Um, how do I approach my levels? Well, I like the kick, depending on the kind of record. If I was doing a very hot active rock record, I would want a lot of beater in the kick. But if I'm doing a record like this, I'd want it to sound like an old Fleetwood Mac record. So I'd want a sort of a puffy or pillowy, more pillowy kick. But I do want to feel that kick if I don't hear it and see it with that beater, I want to feel it. So I'll just make sure that it's just, there's an energy. You know when if you get behind the faders and bring them up, you know when it feels right. And just get a little bit of bump of that kick, make sure the snare is giving you the emotional response you want from it, and the overheads are kind of adding the left, right width, and then you bring that bass up and there's going to be a moment where that feels right. And if you don't know if it feels right, start listening to other records. Reference other records. There's plugins that will allow you to reference within your mix uh, other records so that they won't be going through your DSP that's on your two chain. You'll be able to hear them without effects. But you can listen and say, I love the chemistry of this record, and then match the kick and bass in that record. And slowly you'll start to get a feel for your own DNA where you want that stuff and where it seems to be working and moving you. You know, there's a point in a mix where you start to do this, you know, you start to nod along with it. And if you don't have that or you're wondering, like, man, I wish I was better at that. Reference records that you love the low end and you love that relationship. Just have them on a different place to listen. Go back between your mix and it, bing, bang, bing, bang, quickly. Bring your kick up, bring your bass up, and slowly you'll get a concept for that. That's a good way to do that. Um, from Steve, hey Joe, could you please talk about attack and release times when trying to achieve different feels and sounds? Cheers, Steve. Okay, so I assume you're talking about compressors. Um, man, that's a, that's a whole, compression is a whole that's a whole month discussion. Um, but compression is another thing that a lot of legitimate, talented engineers don't, in my opinion, don't understand. Um, so attack and release, of course, let's try to pull up a compressor here on the screen. I'm gonna pull up a compressor that has, let's see here. Okay, so on, on an 1176, for one reason or another in their infinite wisdom, they made a decision to make the attack times, rather than this be fast attack, which makes so much sense, right? And this be slow attack, it's reverse. So this is fast attack all the way to the right, and this is slow attack and release. So, um, for instance, when you're, go when, you're, when you're putting a signal through something, you wanna shape it with that compressor. Right? I don't use compressors necessarily to limit the dynamic, the dynamic range as much as I use them to give something texture and shape. Um, so you may think with a de-esser you'd want a really fast attack and fast release to get rid of that. I find longer releases make S's more livable, right? So it's so hard to put into words quickly, but I would say in general, um, fast attack times and fast release times work really good on staccato items like drums. But in the same respect, you could totally reshape a drum. Let's take the snare drum. And let's just solo, let me get these. It's gonna sound weird for a second here, but please forgive me. Let's just solo the snare. All right, so let's get this snare drum. And I'm gonna put this 1176 on it. I'm gonna overdo it until we hear it. Let's do fast attack, fast release. Right? The classic Led Zeppelin kind of Stone Temple Pilots thing. I'll put on the headphones so you guys can hear me. So, all the ring comes up, all the buoyancy. Okay, now watch the same drum. I'm going to move the attack back and I'm going to move the release very long. And watch the difference in the character of this drum. It will sound like a completely different drum. completely different character of drum. You'd think he pulled a drum off of the kit and put another one on. Here's the original one. Notice how hairy this one is and ear fatiguing with all the ringing it's dragging up and all the other 
all the other artifacts that are now in the in your drum sound. They're just soloing this particular drum though. Lots of information there, lots of harmonic content. First is this. Very smooth. Uh, it's almost like something went over the top with a cloth. So that's the that's the the five dollar answer. The reality is it's very different. Like the attack and release, the attack time on an 1176, w which the fa the longest, the latest, the slowest attack is one millisecond on an original 1176. I read that somewhere, which kind of blew my mind. So you know, the the slowest attack on another compressor might be 800 milliseconds. You know, so that's almost one second. So you may not, when you look at an attack knob, they're not all the same. The attack knob on a 1176, the slowest attack you can get is still under one millisecond. There's a thousand milliseconds in one second versus something that would be four, 800 times longer, 800 milliseconds when you have it full. So you need to really use your ears and be able to decide uh, what you're hearing and what you want to hear. I would encourage people, people use fast attacks and fast releases because it sounds more exciting and it's always in your face. But what they don't realize is in the greener scheme of things, the longer the release times are, things really chill out in your mix. And then you can pick your moments where you want things to be bright and come out and assault you. But you can have nice, fat sounds that are very easy to listen to. And then choose your moments for the high-end stuff. Hopefully that answers you. Um, okay. Um, did you say there's questions over there in the feed, buddy? Let me go and maybe I'll try to get to that feed. Okay. And then there's multiband compression, which is a totally different breed of cat. I try to not use EQ or use minimal EQ and let my, let my compressors EQ for me. Because you can EQ across time with a compressor. Rather than making a decision and just EQ one decision into your snare drum or into a vocal or into a bass, or a guitar, you can end up saying, hey, I want you to change your EQ over time because sometimes you need this EQ and sometimes you don't. So you have a whole other dimension. It's like adding another dimension on to the space-time continuum, you know? It's like, it's like adding, rather than height, height and width in, in depth, you now have added a third aspect, time to it, which exponentially increases the possibilities. Um, sounds insane, but that is the truth. Um, you can do so much without EQing. You can EQ so many different ways. If you listen to this mix here, this two mix, we're going to use this limiter here. Let me get rid of this guy. Just with the threshold, so on this multiband compressor here, this handles everything from 95 hertz and down, this area. This area handles everything from 95 hertz to 550 hertz. This one will go from 550 to about 5.5K, and then from about 5K up to the up to everywhere else, this handles it. So you have four vertical compressors working here. So you could say, hey, my mix is muddy. I'm going to take some of that mud out. <laughs> Siri thinks I'm talking to her. I'm not sure I understand, she says. Okay, so let's say we think that's boxy and muddy. I'm just going to lower the threshold and listen to the EQ change with this compressor. So by the gain reduction, you can determine by the aggregated total of what that mix has, you can determine, hey, I'm going to let that mid-range, when it gets big, I'm going to have it bring it back a little. I'm going to let it step up when it's not as big. Pardon me? Huh? Low storage. Nine minutes left remaining. Nine minutes left. Okay. Um, so hopefully you understand what that is. You know, it's a great way to start thinking about compression. We can do another hang where we talk just about compression because it really takes, it takes its, the whole thing is like a, it's a master class just to talk about and get yourself, get your head wrapped around compression. Uh, how do you prepare your final mixes for mastering in terms of final EQing and final volume levels? Do you do your own mastering? I do a lot of my own mastering just because the world we live in nowadays, but uh, when I can, I'll use guys like Andy Vandette or Leon Zervos or Greg Calby or, or um, Ted Jensen. Uh, I'd love to use those guys, but you know, sometimes I have to do it, and I do do it. And, um, 
I leave those guys about three to five dB worth of headroom, meaning space on top of my mix, and my peaks would be living maybe at minus, minus three to minus five, at least three decibels of, from the peaks, so that they have some room and they don't have to regain structure stuff. Um, and I leave all my plugins on because that's the sound. You know, that's what they're paying for when they hire a guy to give them a sound. So I'll give them uh, that mix that comes off the end of my console with all the DSP I have on my two bus or whatever I have out in my analog world. Once I print that file, I'll print a version for the client where I have somewhat of quasi-mastering where it's just up at level so that they can, can competitively listen. So when they're on their iPhone, they're not hearing our, our mixes at minus 10, you know, 10 decibels louder than what they're listening to off their phone you know, that's already been mastered. But what I send to the mastering lab is probably peaks that are minus four, minus five, or minus three in that area. That gives those guys enough headroom to do everything they need to do. Um, so that's how I prepare files. And I usually send, I'm working at 32-bit float point, um, which I'd encourage you all to do, which is an incredible format. I think it's, uh, it's much improved over 24-bit in regards to what is possible with just the headroom in that algorithm. It's done off of scientific notation. It's not based off of a linear scale, a hard absolute scale. It f sort of starts uh, as a relative scale from where it hears music. You can recover headroom, things that go into distortion by 2000 dB if you keep it, um, if, if you keep it in that format, a 32-bit flow point format. So I'll deliver a 32-bit flow point formatted uh, file at 48K. I never operate at 44.1, no reason to anymore with the death of CDs. Uh, so 48K is where it's at. It's where all video files live, and I think it's a great sounding format. I don't deal with 192 or 196 or 88 or f any of those other sample frequencies. I'm at 48K, 32-bit float point. Um, Dave Brown, an amazing guitar player and good dude from Pittsburgh. He was in the band called The Gathering Field on Atlantic. Is amazing, amazing guitar player and producer. If you had to pick one recording that you've done that you define as your best representation of your talent, which one would it be? <laughs> I don't know. You know, I mean, I love those Gathering Field records. Dave was in this band called The Gathering Field uh, that I was lucky enough to be able to make a bunch of records, maybe five, six records with those guys. And um, that record, I was a young kid, and I still had all the fire in my eye. As much as I try to keep fire in my eye every day, I was... Um, I was just unbelievably excited to be on that record, and that record changed me. And um, it showed me what music could be, great music could be. And I tried to then just continually be a part of great records. Well, the best record that I've maybe been a part of, um, as a songwriter, you know, I think it'd probably be uh, Without You for Keith Urban. I think that that song really, you know, it's a good one. People love that song, and I love that song. Um, as an engineer and producer, it's hard to say. I don't know that one comes to mind. And I don't know that I have the perfect definitive recording, you know? I mean, as much as I'm able to sign off on these recordings, I don't know that I'm ever able to really point at one and say that that was the one. You know, after you do it for 30 years, you got so many records that you've worked on. Um, like this song here. I just found this song on my drive because I was looking for something and I didn't want to use what I had used for the Waves competition. I just wanted to find a new piece of media, and this is something I found, and as soon as I heard it, I said, man, what a great record, you know? So it's, it's always good when records surprise you. I'll be driving up to Pittsburgh to go up for the holidays, and, and uh, there's been a couple times where I'll hear a song of mine on the radio, and for a couple measures, I don't know it's my song. And, um, and I'm always like, I'll be like, oh, I like this song, and then you realize that it's your song. And that's a special feeling, because then you, you've listened to it as an outsider, and you've gotten to say, hey, I really like that, and, uh, you don't feel like you're just liking your own songs, and uh, I just, I guess I can't think. Do you believe me now was a, was a pre pretty big high point, but um, there's a lot of records. I've been really lucky. Uh, I've desperately wanted to be a part, and Dave Brown will attest to this, because I just followed ga the gathering field around until they let me record them. Um, and that experience and other experiences, I've been fortunate to be in the room with a lot of people that are more talented than me, and I've been able to hopefully rise to the occasion and be at least as good as they were, and maybe together we were better than what we were separate. So um, I don't know if that's an answer or not. Uh, what's my opinion on analog summing? I have a dangerous two bus sitting here that I use. Uh, um, that's okay, buddy. I don't think it will go off. 
I think it would just stop, terminate my recording on the actual hard drive over there, but it will still broadcast. Um, I have a Dangerous 2 bus here that I like a lot, but you know, I was mastering a record with Gene Paul, Les Paul's son. Les Paul, the guy who invented multi-track recording and the Les Paul. His son, Gene Paul, I don't know if he's still alive, uh, but he was a, a, mix, a mastering engineer in New York City, and he was using it, and he was hitting, rather than using it as a summing box, he was just putting stereo, a stereo mix through it and then hitting it very hard like we, would, like we used to hit center sections in analog consoles on the SSL and on the Neve 80 series. If you'd hit the center sections at certain, with certain amounts of gain hitting them, you could sort of create a new sound that was like, oh, this is a really cool thing. And it was pervasive in the SSL E series, E with G, that G center section um, would really sound cool if you hit it hard. So you'd go into these studios in New York and the guys would have the meters pegged like this, but it just had a great sound. So um, they kind of do that. I kind of do that with my danger. So I'll come off my digital setup and hit my analog world and um, before I hit my analog compressors, I'll hit it really hard through the Dangerous, just as a two, two track, so just using one and two of my 16. Um, but I did recently, Jeff Frankel, a really talented uh, artist and engineer from Chicago, um, we were checking out a song and we separated out this song across it. And I mean, it does sound great. I prefer, I think my symphony sums very, very good. So um, I prefer to keep it summing there and I think it sounds better when I hit it. Um, in the summing mixer. I've listened to the Shadow Hills, I've listened to the Neve. Um, I think there's value there. I would question, they're big money items, so I would question if I could spend, let's say it's a 2000 or 3000 or some of them are $5,000 acquisitions. I would question if $5,000 couldn't be spent more effectively in my studio if I was struggling and I had five grand. I don't know that that's the first thing I'd spend five grand on. Um, I don't know who Frosty Nipples is, but they say, Frosty Nipples says he's a big fan. Are you Frosty Nipples, Zach? No. Okay. Thanks, Frosty Nipples. Bill wants to know, what's your favorite cigar? My favorite cigar, and feel free to send me a box of them, because they're, you cannot find them now. They are Cohiba Bahiques, which is a the top of the line Cohiba, the Cuban Cohiba. Cohiba US and Cohiba Cuba are separate, completely different companies. Uh, since we didn't acknowledge them, uh, they don't, we don't honor the trademark. Uh, we didn't honor the trademark, so they, the Cohibas you get here are not the same. Uh, so it would be a Cohiba Bahique would be my favorite. And it's, uh, you can't find them. They had some sort of issue and you can't find them anymore. So. But I love um, Opus X, I love a lot of Perdomos. I love the Perdomo 12-year um, vintage where they take, the, um, they take the tobacco and they put it in whiskey barrels for 12 years.